Good morning and a warm welcome to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's worship God together. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to adore, to worship and praise you. You are God. You're the creator of heaven and earth. You're the one who gives us life moment by moment. You're the one who gave your son, who died and rose again on the first day of the week. Thank you for giving us this day, a day of rest, a day of reflection on your truth. Help us in what we do. May it be for your glory, for your honour, for your praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's now praise God in song in Psalm 36 and sing psalms. Singing there from verse 5. Your steadfast love is great, O Lord. It reaches heaven high. Your faithfulness is wonderful, extending to the sky. Let's pray together now. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer and then I'll continue after that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. It is remarkable that we can come to the infinite God and address you as our Father in the heavens. Lord, as we've been singing, your righteousness, your love, your goodness, your power is without limits. You are the great and awesome God who sustains every life of man and of creatures. You're the one that brought all this glorious universe into existence in the first place. And you're the one that sustains it every moment. You're the one that is working out your purposes and plans for humanity through the work of Jesus Christ, your Son. 
We thank you for this first day of the week, which always reminds us that Jesus is alive. He died, he suffered for sinners, but he rose again, conquering death, overcoming Satan, overcoming sin, having paid the price of our sin. Lord Jesus, we adore you because you are God. You are our Saviour. You're one with the Father, and yet we are one with you. We have been adopted into your family. We are your brothers and sisters. We are one with you. What a wonderful plan of salvation. We acknowledge your greatness and goodness, your love and your wisdom, Lord, that you should do this for an unworthy world. We confess our own sinfulness. We rebel against you every day. We do not do what you tell us to do. We do not live the perfect lives that you require of us. We thank you then that in Christ all that sin and rebellion is forgiven, that we are accepted in the beloved. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of compassion, a God of mercy and kindness. You know the difficulties that we face as a nation and as individuals as a consequence of the coronavirus. We live in a broken world that's under your curse, a reminder to us that we have sinned. We are, we have been estranged from you because of our wickedness. Lord, but thank you that you are a God of goodness and grace. And we rejoice that uh, there's a vaccine that has been developed, that there is hope to uh, overcome this thing. But Lord, we pray more than anything that you would bring spiritual blessing to our nation as a consequence of this, that people would be reminded of their own mortality, that they would see their own weakness and turn to you for life. Lord, we thank you that all your people are secure, that everyone who's in Christ Jesus can have that confidence that your love for them will never end, that whatever difficulties and problems we may face in this world, they are nothing compared to the glory that you have laid up for us in heaven. Lord, thank you so much for the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray for workers to be sent out into the harvest that you would bring many others into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We pray for your spirits. Lord Jesus, you've told us that our Father is so willing to give the spirit to those who ask. And so we pray for that spirit of revelation and of wisdom that he would fill us and empower us to do good to others and bring glory to you. We thank you so much that we're able to uh, worship you through modern technology, it's a blessing from you and we rejoice in all the good things that you give us. We deserve none of it. You are so wonderful, Lord God, and we adore you. Forgive us and bless us richly for your own praise and glory. Amen. Let's read God's word together in John chapter 3, John chapter 3 verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. 
I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. And then let's read as well in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, where we have a record of the incident that Jesus refers to, where the serpent, the snake, was lifted up in the wilderness. Numbers 21, verse 4. They, the people of Israel, they travelled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go round Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Amen. This is God's glorious word, and we pray it'll be a blessing to us and bring him glory. Let's sing again. This time we'll sing from Psalm 130. Lord, from the depths I call to you. Lord, hear me from on high, and give attention to my voice when I for mercy cry.
Let's go back to John chapter 3 and let's read verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Let's ask God to bless his word to us. Lord, we recognize our enormous privilege in having the Bible. The Word of God is the most precious thing that we can possess in this world. It is a revelation of you. You explain to us the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. But again, we acknowledge that we cannot understand spiritual things simply by our own cleverness and intellect. We are entirely dependent on you. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill our hearts and minds, that he would speak through me to bring me and all of us rich blessing through through your grace in Christ. Hear us then and do us good. And may you be praised and honoured as we reflect on these wonderful truths. Amen. This incident we have in John chapter 3 of Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night occurred early on in Jesus' ministry. Jesus had been baptised and then he had gone down to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover and he had done some signs and wonders there. He had, his first sign was in, Gal- in Cana in Galilee but subsequently he comes to Jerusalem and plainly he had done miraculous things there although we have no record, direct record of them. Nicodemus has heard of these things or perhaps has even seen them. He is a prominent leader of the Jewish religious parties. When Jesus refers to him, he says, are you not the teacher of Israel? He seems to have have had a particular, a particularly important role in uh, the life, the religious life of Israel. And he is the one, Nicodemus, who, he's obviously a bit embarrassed that he's going to speak to Jesus because Jesus is an ordinary layperson. He's not part of the religious elite. And so Nicodemus goes to him at night when no one will see him. Nicodemus comes to him saying, we know that you're a teacher come from God because of the signs that you're doing. Nobody could do these things. And what seems to be implied in his statement is, how do you do this? For Nicodemus, in his experience of God, he never had seen such things. He never had witnessed such things. He was never able to do such things. He knew of nobody who'd been capable of doing such things until Jesus himself comes and does these miraculous things, these signs that are pointing to the fact that he is a man from God. Jesus' response is to tell Nicodemus that he must be born again if he is to be part of the kingdom of God. That if he is to be, to understand how these things are done, if he is to understand the relationship of God with men, then he has to be part of the kingdom. And that can only be through the new birth. As Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, he makes it plain that he's not telling Nicodemus anything new. That he is a teacher in Israel. He knows the, the Old Testament scriptures. And yet he doesn't know the basic fact that you need to have a transformation of your life before you could be part of the kingdom of God, part of the activity of God on earth. So Jesus goes on to explain what that new birth involves and how we can be involved in the new birth, how we can experience that new birth. And we come on to this wonderful um, section of Jesus' words where we have no doubt the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. So I want to reflect then on these 
verses 14 to 18 and see first of all the greatness of God's plan his plan of salvation the greatness of God's plan in verse 14 we've read it already just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert so the son of man must be lifted up everyone who believes in him may have eternal life Jesus is talking to a man who knows his Old Testament he knows the stories of the wilderness of the exodus Israel being delivered from their slavery in Egypt and brought on their 40 year journey through the wilderness to the promised land and he knows this story about how the Israelites had rebelled against Moses and against God God had sent these venomous snakes amongst them and rather than just removing the snakes as God easily could have done he tells Moses to make a snake and anyone who simply looks at that snake will be healed it was a picture of what God was going to do through Jesus Christ this is part of God's plan this is 1500 years before Jesus comes into the world and plainly God is working out his plan of salvation here is a picture of the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ you see these people who were bitten were going to die and the simple solution was simply to look at the snake and as they looked at the snake that had been raised up on a pole simply looking at the snake brought instant healing and Jesus says just as the snake was raised up like that so the son of man must be lifted up the son of man is Jesus favorite expression for himself is taken from the book of Daniel where Daniel has a vision of the son of man being led into the presence of God this wonderful exalted prestigious individual who is given rule over all the nations of the world Jesus says that glorious individual in reference to himself has to be lifted up he's referring to the crucifixion here is Jesus fairly early on in his ministry and he knows very well what's at the end of his three and a half years he knows he's to suffer crucifixion and the greatness of God's plan is that anyone who looks to the son of man on that cross and believes that that son of man is dying for him will be instantly healed from death and forgiven God's plan of salvation is not something that was put together relatively recently this goes all the way back to Moses it goes back to Abraham it goes right, right back to the beginning of time where God said to the serpent that the seed of the woman would crush his head that Satan and his kingdom are doomed this is this wonderful plan that God has it's so simple and yet so profound the son of man this glorious individual that God was to send into the world was going to be lifted up on a cross and anyone who simply looks at him a look of faith anyone who believes in him will have everlasting life will be freed from death will be healed just as the Israelites were healed from their snake bite such a great plan it's all come from God God has taken the initiative he has done this for a world that was helpless that could do nothing for itself just as those Israelites when they'd been bitten they were dying there was nothing they could do except look to the bronze snake 
Friends, this is the greatness of the plan of God to bring salvation to the world. To bring salvation to you and to me through the Son of Man being lifted up on that cross. Let's think secondly of the greatness of God's love. The greatness of God's love. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. For, there's that connecting word with what's just gone before. Here is the demonstration of God's love. For God so loved the world. The word so there is a translation of a word that means thus. In this way. It's not saying God loved the world so much. Although he did. Rather it's saying in this way. This is how God has expressed his love to the world. Paul writes to the Romans. This is how God demonstrates his love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the way by which God has demonstrated his love. Your, lo your life, my life is full of good things. Every moment we live is a blessing from God. It's a sign of God's love for us. He loves to give good gifts. But here's the ultimate demonstration of the love. This is the way that God loved his wor the world. He gave his one and only son. The word that's translated one and only, or in the older version, the only begotten son, is a word that's used to describe Abraham and his son Isaac in Hebrews chapter 11 we read about how faith, by faith Abraham offered his one and only son his only begotten son Isaac was Abraham's most precious son he was the one in whom all the promises of God were wrapped up and yet God, God calls him to offer that son to kill that son, to sacrifice that son, to burn him to ashes. It's a pale reflection of what God himself has done. He has given his one and only son. His very heart, the most precious thing, I'm not saying the most precious person that God has his own heart his own his very being he's been enjoying the son's fellowship along with the spirit forever and ever and ever father son and spirit in perfect unity enjoying one another forever and god the father willingly gives his own son for the world gives the son to that cross to be lifted up on a cross the most gruesome horrific form of execution that man has ever invented friends what greater demonstration of God's love could there be than the, him giving his own son for the world for you for me we are the world we are part of this world friends if God was only going to save you if you were the only one individual that you were going to be that God was going to save he would have to give his son just for you just for me but this is the demonstration of the greatness of God's love and it's a love that originates in God. What is there in you or in me to love? By nature we are God's enemies. We go our own way. We don't do what God requires of us. We've sinned. We're wicked. We're evil people by nature. 
there is nothing in us to attract us to, to, to attract God to us this is the greatness of his love that he simply loved us because he loved us because he wanted to because he chose to and he's demonstrated the greatness of his love in the giving of his own son his one and only son his very heart his very being because he loved you he saw you as being so precious so valuable so special you're made in his own image that he was willing to give his own son to save you let's just think let's reflect thirdly on the greatness of God's promise the greatness of God's promise going on verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him here's the promise of God he sent his son it can, it's best translated so that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life everlasting life here's the promise of God you believe in Jesus and you will not be condemned as you deserve as I deserve instead you will have everlasting life it's as simple as that it's simply on the basis of faith the word that's translated first in whoever anyone who believes in his son is literally into it's a it's more than simply a intellectual assent uh, of belief yeah I believe that Jesus is the son of God I believe that's a fact of history I, I believe that he died and rose again that's not that's part of what believing into him means but it's becoming part of Jesus is wanting him to be part of our lives is accepting that he has the right to be sovereign over our lives to be our Lord and our master to believe into him that what he has done on that cross he was doing for me that he was taking my place that he was suffering as my substitute that he bore the wrath of God which I should have borne that he rose victorious for me so that I might be justified so that all my sin is taken away and God declares me righteous perfect forever and that's the poor greatness of God's promise that's what God promises you believe into Jesus you believe that all that he did on the cross was done for you and he promises you will not be condemned you will not perish you deserve to perish I deserve to perish the wages of sin is death I'm a sinner I do things wrong I have wrong thoughts wrong attitudes wrong motives I say things I shouldn't I earn God's wrath but there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus those who have believed into Christ become part of him are integrated into him they have the righteousness of Christ they are accepted by the Father just as Christ is we are in him in a way that can never be changed 
Jesus says here that not only will he not perish, will not be condemned, the one who believes into him will not be condemned, but will have eternal life. What Jesus says here is we'll have life of the age. It's not primarily about a life that's going to go on forever, which is a wonderful truth. But the people of Israel at this time were looking forward to the coming of a new age. So they believed that as the Messiah came, as the king came that was promised to David, he was going to establish Israel as a glorious new kingdom. And here's this promise that those who believe into Jesus, into the Son of Man, into the one and only Son, they have a life of the age. That's what God is promising. Yes, it's going to be a la uh, an everlasting life. But it's more than that. It's a fullness of life. It's a promise of being part of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus started off with in this passage. He was telling Nicodemus, you have to be born again to be part of this kingdom. There has to be this radical transformation of you, inwardly, before you can see the kingdom of God, before you can be part of God's activities through his king. And that new birth comes about simply by belief in Jesus. And friends, that everlasting life or that life of the age starts now. When you're born again, when you believe in the Lord Jesus, then you are given life of the age. You have a new life that's going to go on forever. But it's a life, a fuller life, than anything that you could experience otherwise. It's a life lived in relationship with God. God is part of my life and part of your life if you're following the Lord Jesus. You know him. You've experienced his working in your life. You've seen him helping you with problems and difficult situations. You're aware of his presence and nearness in difficult times. You recognize his love and the good things that he gives you every day. He is part of your life. That's the life of the age. And it's only going to get better. And along with that life of the age, it's part of living in a community, in a kingdom. We have brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the main, one of the big problems that has arisen as a consequence of the restrictions due to the coronavirus is loneliness. People are missing having that contact with other people it's part of being a human being we need relationships with other people we're made in the image of God God has relationships father sons and spirit they love one another they enjoy one another's company and fellowship and when that's not there something is missing it's painful it's difficult Sin has brought a disruption of that relationship so that people have difficulties in relationships or in the present circumstances we're missing having relations with others. But God's solution to the problem is to create the church. To make this community of people who've been born again, people who are one with Christ, people who've believed into the Lord Jesus. And we belong to one another and we belong to Christ. We have that everlasting life now. That life of the age now. It's going to get better. 
when we come into the fullness of his kingdom, then there will be a perfect relationship between all God's people and all the nations of the world that have been saved with all their different cultures. They'll all be brought together and there'll be such richness and fullness. This is God's promise to make us part of that community. Having life of the age brings meaning to life, a purpose. What are we here for? If we're just accidents, if it's all come about by chance, we, we're born, we live, we die, so what? But if we have life of the age, then we know that there's purpose, there's meaning. We're living for God, we're living for his people, we're living to glorify Jesus. To enjoy him forever. And the marvel of the, all of this glorious truth. Is that it simply comes to us by faith. That's all God requires of you. All God requires of me. That you believe into the name of his one and only son. That you accept that that actually happened. That he died on a cross. He was lifted up. And he died for you. Turn from your sin. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Believe into the Lord Jesus. And you will be saved. And you will have this life of the age. A life that's going to go on forever. But a fullness of life. That you cannot experience any other way. And then finally... We see here, the, see here the greatness of God's sending. In verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Here's the greatness of God's sending. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, which is a remarkable fact. When John uses the word world, it's not simply the, all the nations on this planet. For John, the world is the whole of mankind in its rebellion against God. That it is set against God. It, it is God's enemy. And that's the remarkable thing, that instead of condemning the world in its rebelliousness, he comes to save the world. God is a God of absolute justice, and you could well imagine that he would send his son into this world to condemn this world, to bring judgment on the world in its sin and wickedness. But instead of that, he sends his son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. It is an amazing truth. Christmas has passed now, but there's this wonderful picture, wonderful truth of God becoming a human being. And the baby is to be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Not he will come to condemn the world, but rather he'll come to save the world. To save his people from their sins. Friends, that is the very nature of God. God loves to save. I believe that finds expression in human nature. We are made in the image of God. And so that same desire to save is there too. I um, saw something on the television the other day. It was an advert encouraging people to give to cancer research which because of the coronavirus has is not been receiving as much funding not as much support as it would normally do and the person who was speaking was encouraging people to give for the purpose 
of saving lives. The purpose was to save lives. Why do we want to save people's lives? People that have, that we don't know, no relationship with us at all, but yet we have this desire to save people. <coughs> it's a desire that comes from our being made in the image of God. God wants to save people. And because of that, he sent his son into the world. Friends, if you believe, you are saved. It's guaranteed. There's no more required. We can't do anything else besides. We simply have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God loves to save. And he guarantees that salvation to anyone who believes. You can tell anyone in your family, anyone amongst your friends, anyone you come across, you can tell them, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's the promise of God. He hasn't come to condemn the world, but he's come to save the world. But there is this solemn warning in here as well. Everyone who does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed into God's one and only Son. God has done everything that is necessary for our salvation, He has done everything that's required. There's nothing left for us to do except to accept it. And to believe. He's done it at great cost. He sent his own son. He demonstrated his love for you. And are you going to then say. No. Don't believe it. Not interested. Don't think I need it. I'm a good person. Here's God warning us. Anyone who does not believe stands condemned it's a solemn truth that the message of God's love and salvation has these two sides to it the main emphasis is believe and you'll be saved that's the very purpose of Jesus coming God didn't send his, word, his son to condemn the world but to save the world However, the other side is, if you don't believe, if you don't accept, after all that God has done for you, you stand condemned. And the longer you resist, the longer you refuse to believe, the harder you become, the greater your condemnation becomes, and the greater will be your suffering, your judgment. Friends, if you've believed you have life of the age, of that new age that's to come, you're part of the kingdom, you've entered the kingdom of God through the new birth. And it's all because of God's love. God loved you and gave his son for you. Is there any greater demonstration of the love of God than his sending of his son, not to condemn us, but to save us. We have such good news. Ask God to give you opportunities to tell other people this good news. They need to be saved. They need to be born again. They need to know of the love of God in Christ. And if they believe, everyone who comes to Christ, everyone who comes to God in Christ and believes in his Son is guaranteed they will not be condemned. They will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. Life of the age that is going to go on forever. Life in that new world that God 
is going to create where righteousness and joy and love and peace and kindness and goodness fill our days forever. What a great and awesome God, a wonderful, loving, gracious, merciful, kind God we have. Let's praise him and adore him and thank him for his goodness. Amen. We'll pray together. Lord, you are such a wonderful, great, awesome, kind, loving, gracious, merciful God. And we adore you for that. We praise you for the gift of Jesus Christ, that you loved us, that you gave your own son. Lord Jesus, you willingly gave yourself up for us. You suffered the wrath of God so that we would not have to suffer it. Give us opportunities to tell other people this good news, that we may see many coming to faith in you, believing in the Son of God, knowing your forgiveness and your everlasting life. Lord, bless us that we in turn might bring blessing to others for the glory of your own great and awesome name. Amen. Let's conclude by singing Psalm 21 in the older version. The King in thy great strength, O Lord, shall very joyful be. In that salvation rejoice, how vehemently shall he. This is a psalm that's written by King David, and he's talking about himself. But it's prophetic as well. It's describing King Jesus and the joy that he finds in the salvation that he himself has brought about. We'll sing verses 1 to 5 to God's praise. Let's close now with the benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and forever. 
Amen.